Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, here we are. Uh, so we're getting into the sections and some of the physiology. Um, so this chapter does things a little bit different because as it does each anatomical portion, it kind of does the physiology there with it, um, which is a little bit more unique. Um, a little bit kind of like how the respiratory system does. Not entirely, but a little bit. Now, we're going to start with the oral cavity. And there's four big things that happen in our oral cavity or the mouth. Well, one of the first things is we do some sensory analysis. Now, that's a variety of things. How does the food taste? Um, but everybody's like, well, why is that important? Well, one of the first things is you might realize as you eat the food and you go, oh, this food has gone bad. Or you feel in it like, oh, there's a big piece of bone in here that if I swallow that might cut me open. Or there's a piece of glass or a hard piece of plastic. There's something in there that might harm me. Uh, it's gone bad. It's too hot and spicy. It might really make me sick. Um, you know, this is something that I don't enjoy, whatever. Uh, so there's a lot of things about that uh, that we sens sensory analyze food for before we swallow it. And then we also are mechanically digesting. We call that mastication. What's mastication? Chewing. We're using our teeth, our tongue, and our palates to mechanically digest and masticate. Mastication means to chew. If you guys remember the muscles of mastication, was the masseter muscle and the temporalis muscle. Uh, we lubricate the food by mixing it with saliva and mucus as well. And then there's some chemical digestion of carbohydrates and lipids. We're going to talk about how the saliva and the tongue uh, both contain enzymes that are uh, going to help digest some of the material. So let's start in the oral cavity. Let's see the hard palate. The hard palate is made by two bones, the uh, palatine bone and the maxillary bone. Maxillary bone and palatine bone. This is the palatine process of maxillary bone. This is the mac, uh, palatine bone. And this is the rest of your ma maxillary bone where you would find your uh, alveolar processes. Now. The soft palate is back here, which it does contain the uvula, which we talked about. There is an upper lift, a superior labia, and an inferior labia, which are attached to the lip, attached to the gums via the labial frenulum. So it is the flap of tissue that attaches lips to gum called the labial frenulum. Uh, the vestibule is the space located inside the lips and cheeks. This is where a person puts their dip. The tongue is what actually tastes the food and moves food around. And the lingual frenulum is what attaches the tongue to the bottom of the oral cavity. It's found right here. Uh, I don't have a good picture in this uh, set of notes. I do in my lab. Now, uh, the teeth, uh, there are four types of teeth that a human uh, skull contains. There are the incisors, the cuspids, the bicuspids, and molars. The incisors are like a blade. And what might you do with a blade is make an incision. So the blade-like teeth, they usually have one, they have one root to them, the incisors. Now, there are actually two types, the two centrals and the two lateral incisors. In the adult and the, and the child here, we have them here. The cuspids or canines are the sharp teeth located here and here on both sides. Uh, they have one root as well. Then behind that, there are the two bicuspids, the two bicuspid called premolars. They have one to two roots, but they have flattened crowns to grind. Then there are three molars, first, second, and third molar. Third molar is called the wisdom tooth. Uh, they are, again, wide and flat crowns. Now, they have two to three roots, whereas the bicuspid has one to two. Molars have two or three roots. Now, you actually have two sets of teeth. Now, um, it's, it's, it's probably a word you heard back in elementary school, the word deciduous. Deciduous trees are trees that lose their leaves in the fall. So most of the trees we have around us, except for pine trees, are deciduous. They lose their leaves in the fall. So your deciduous teeth, your baby teeth, what happened to them? They all fell out. You lost all your baby teeth. Here's your baby teeth called the deciduous teeth, and you lost them. Normally there are 20 of them, which means that there's quite possibly, I know that somewhere there's a jewelry box, and there's uh, inside that jewelry box there's a little K 
little box inside my mom's jewelry box that has 20 little teeth in it. Now, that's kind of creepy when you think about it. You know, now, normally an adult has 32 teeth. Now, I'm saying normally. Is there abnormalities? Absolutely. Now, I have less than that. Uh, I have six less than 32. Um, I had to lose my second premolar and my uh, third molars on my uppers and lowers. So I lost my two upper premolars. Two of my upper premolars uh, were extracted to make room because I had to have uh, extensive orthodontic work. Uh, straight my teeth. I had a buckle crossbite. And um, the... Um, the other thing was uh, I had my four of my wisdom teeth removed. Um, so I actually have six less than 32. But there's normal, then there's really crazy. And uh, uh, I think it's like 200 and, oh, sorry, uh, 526. There were 526 teeth in this boy's mouth. Okay. 526 teeth. Uh, you imagine that. 232 teeth in Mumbai, 526 teeth. Uh, they could just get... Uh, uh, they grow all over the roof of the mouth and everything like this. So people get these conditions like that with extra teeth um so anyway yeah there's our normal day of creepy now speaking of creepy these skulls are this is a child skull here with all the uninterrupted unerupted teeth here so this makes 50 teeth that's uh, sorry 52 teeth <laughs> that a normal human being has in their lifetime now, a tooth has three regions, a crown, a neck, and a root. The crown is what sticks up above the gum line. What's down below the gums is the root that actually fits to anchor it into the maxilla or mandible. And then the neck is the space between the two. The dentin is the material found in the tooth that's like bone but without cells. The pulp cavity is located inside the crown of the tooth. It has all your blood vessels and nerves and things and cells. And this is where one of the places you could get an abscess. It's also common to have abscesses located between the tooth and the bone. Uh, that's when a root canal is done. Uh, the root canal is the hole at the bottom of the tooth where the uh, of the tube that the pulp cavity travels to go out into the tooth. Sorry, the apical frame is the hole in the bottom that the root canal leads out of. The enamel is what covers the dentin of the crown, whereas the dentin of the root is covered in cementum. The gum near the teeth is called the gingiva, which is what uh, the disease of that is called gingivitis. The gum disease, gingivitis. And the periodontal ligaments, what holds the tooth actually to the bone, is why periodontal surgery, periodontist, periodontist. <clears throat> okay, now... Um, now, salivary glands. There's actually three pairs and they have what's called serous glands, and they produce salivary amylase, and that is a carbohydratase. It breaks down polysaccharides. And then there's mucus cells that make mucins to help lubricate the food along with the liquid. Now remember, serous cells always secrete liquidy secretions. Mucus secreting cells secrete mucusy, so this is a mixed gland, okay? It has both. We talk about that in, in the histology section. Uh, in AMP1. Now, parotid salivary glands, they're in the cheeks. They only make about 25% of the overall saliva. But it contains amylase, and it drains the oral cavity using your parotid duct, also called the Stinson's duct. Now, the sublinguals, they also produce saliva, but most of it is a buffer. It produces a saliva buffer, 
uh, basically it produces a material we're going to talk about called uh, bicarbonate. And then it also makes mucus. And it drains in the oral cavity by sublingual duct, also called the rivenous duct. But most of the saliva, 70% of saliva, is submandibular, which makes amylase and mucus. It is by far the most mixed. It has the serous cells making amylase secretion and mucus for lubrication. And it goes through the submandibular ducts. Ducts, sorry. Uh, the sublinguals... Uh, here should say ducks, and I actually um, it should be plural. Uh, it's my fault for not catching that. <clears throat> okay, uh, the Wharton's duct uh, is another name for the submandibular duct. Okay, and you know I do expect you guys to know the alternate names. So as you can see, parotid submandibular and sublingual now saliva your body makes about a liter to a liter and a half of saliva a day and it's about 99.4 percent water uh, so it's mostly water and only 0.6 percent of that remaining is solute and the solutes is things like electrolytes, like your sodium chloride, your bicarbonate, the buffers. Like bicarbonate is a major component of the buffer, but there's other buffer. There's some protein buffers, things like that. Uh, and it tries to keep the pH around 7, uh, preventing acid buildup from the oral bacteria. Uh, also helps to control things like uh, uh, thrush and things like that, oral thrush. Uh, can prevent um, fungal infection. Uh, there are glycoproteins to help make it lubricated. There are antibodies called IgAs to control the bacteria. The IgAs, remember, they're the ones that attack before you enter. There are enzymes like amylase that's found there, for example. And there's other waste products the saliva has. So sometimes with saliva, you can detect some waste products, some chemicals that might be there based on some things you've consumed which can ultimately lead to uh, saliva being used uh, as a test as well for a certain condition. Now, saliva lubricates the mouth. It moistens the food, lubricates the food. It also helps us to digest chemicals. Now, what, what, what do we mean? Dissolves chemicals. It disassociates ionic compounds. So the ions found in the sodium and chloride and salt, for example, can stimulate the salty receptors. And it can help dissolve chemicals with its enzymes to help get the sweet stimulated. And it also aids in chemical digestion saliva for your carbohydrates and lipids because secretions from the tongue will ultimately contribute to saliva and help me break down lipids. It's called lingual lipase, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And I'm getting a little sip of coffee. Now, the pharynx is always found the pharynx very fascinating to me because the pharynx is where all food, water, and air that you consume has to pass in with the exception of what you absorb through your skin or what you absorb through your rectum. And normally, everything has to go through the pharynx. Now, from here, it can go into the airway or to the esophagus. We want to go to the esophagus. Now, the esophagus is about a foot long, uh, which uh, uh, let me uh, let me do something real quick. There we go. I went ahead and put a uh, some metric units in there because we're scientists and scientists use metric system. So it's about a about a foot long and about a quarter of an inch in diameter, which is uh, about thirty uh, not am cm uh, centimeter. Uh, so it's about 30.48 uh, centimeters and uh, long and about 1.905 centimeters in diameter. Um, now the upper part eventually goes through the abdominal cavity and it goes through what is called a hi uh, esophageal hiatus that's found in your diaphragm. This is where you get hiatal hernia and it goes into the abdominal cavity. Now the upper part of it is actually voluntary to actually for initiation of swallowing and the inferior part is autonomic or involuntary. It's actually controlled by sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems 
and has four layers. Now remember how our gut was smart because it had two Masters of Science degrees? Our esophagus is not as smart. It went and got an MS, then it's like that was too hard, I'm going to get an MA next. So it gets a Masters of Science, then gets a Masters of Art. And you guys know my feeling on the humanities. Now, mucosa, submucosa, muscular externa, just like the rest of the gut. But here, there is no serosa. It's called an adventitia. So the mucosa is the innermost layer. Uh, that is what is in contact with the food. That's the mucous membrane. The submucosa actually has mucus glands in it. The muscular externa is the smooth muscle tissues for the movements. And the adventitia is the outermost layer. Because there's no serosa, there's an adventitia. Adventitia. Sometimes adventitia is also the name given to the tunica externa of a blood vessel. Excuse me, I got the hiccups. Okay, now, so let's talk about how we swallow. So we said that the first part of the esophagus is voluntarily, but the rest of it's autonomic. So swallowing can be initiated voluntarily. You can voluntarily decide it's time to swallow. I just did it. I just decided I wanted to swallow. Or not. Now, there will be an involuntary swallowing response if something gets far enough. Now, there are three subdivision phases of phases of swallowing called deglutition. Fancy name for swallowing is deglutition. Buccal, buccal phase or buccal phase, pharyngeal phase, esophageal phase. Now, the buccal phase is when I take food, I push against a hard palate and push that food in the pharynx. So when you swallow, tongue goes up. It pushes it up against the hard palate. It then pushes a bolus of food into the pharynx. And once it hits the pharynx, there are tactile receptors there that activate the pharyngeal phase that becomes to be the part where the swallowing reflex takes over. Then it swallows, and then we go into the esophagus where we go to the stomach. The bolus goes down the esophagus, then it enters the stomach through the cardiac sphincter or lower esophageal sphincter or cardiac sphincter, and that gets in the stomach. Now in the stomach, there's going to be many enzymes and acids here so a lot of digestion happens in your stomach the stomach being this expandable tube like a sack it could stretch a lot okay sorry i had to stretch okay sorry about that and um it stores food it mechanically digests it, and it chemically digests it with acids and enzymes. And it produces a partially digested food mixture called chyme, where the acidic secretions are there. Chyme is produced by the stomach. And this chyme will enter in. So let's look at the major parts of the stomach. There are four major regions, a cardia, a fundus, a body, and a pylorus. The cardia is right here near the cardiac sphincter. It's the heart of the stomach. It's the smallest part. It's the uppermost part of stomach. There's a lot of goblet cells here to make mucus that protect us from any acids that churn up towards the esophagus. And this really should have been spaced over there. That's my fault. Uh, sometimes I don't catch these things. Uh, when I go through edits, um, when I first wrote these notes, uh, I absolutely hated my first draft of them. Uh, it was horrible. And then I re completely rewrote it. I'm much happier, but... Um, so there's actually, uh, it protects us from acids and enzymes. So it really only has a specialized goblet cell. There's really no specialized cells. Now the fundus is this hump. And its major specialized cells called gastric glands. And, oops. I hate that I keep doing that, but you know if I don't do it, it's just not going to happen. And then I'm going to forget. Oh, sorry. Let me pause real quick. I got to. Uh, sorry. Sneezing fit is over. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so our fundus contains some gastric glands. 
Uh, give me one second here. I need to fix something. Sorry, that's just bugging me. If I don't do it now, it won't happen. Okay, so what we're going to see is your body by far is the largest part. And this is going to be this major area here, the largest part. And it's located between your fundus, the hump, and this area here called the pylorus. And uh, it is actually where most of the food is mixed with secretions. And gastric glands uh, here secrete most of your acids. And see if I can fix something here. No, it seems like everything's just bugging me right now <laughs> about my notes. Okay, now uh, the pylorus is the area here. Again, I okay, so I think I fixed it a little bit better. And the gastric glands here are going to be chief cells, parietal cells, and goblet cells. That's going to be mostly what you're going to find here. Now, we also have our pyloric antrum, canal, and sphincter. Pyloric sphincter being the most important right here that I want to talk about controlling to the duodenum. Uh, I'll get a little bit more into that in a minute. Now, there is a lesser curvature and a greater curvature. Lesser curvature is the medial side. The lateral side is the greater curvature. There are three layers of muscle. Instead of longitudinal and circular muscles, there is a third layer, an oblique. So in the stomach, if you want to go, let's say somebody was saying, hey, we're going to break uh, quarantine. We're going to come over and eat some dinner. Say, hey, let's come over so we can eat. Let's come over. Longitudinal, circular, oblique, outside in. Longitudinal, circular, oblique. And the rugae are the folds inside. Now, I'm going to talk about these and draw these out. Uh, I'm going to kind of go one by one with them. Let me just pick a, let's pick a color. <clears throat> purple. Let's do purple. Okay. Let's talk about these cells. And let's start with the gastric glands, parietal cells, and the other cell, the pyloric glands, and the gastric glands. And let's talk about these cells here, and let's get into them a little bit and talk about chief cells, uh, all that. Parietal cells make intrinsic factor, which is needed to absorb vitamin B12, and it also makes your hydrochloric acids. Now, we're going to help you guys remember that. Uh, now, uh, so what I'm going to do is parietal cells... Parietal cells, they're going to make intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid. Now, so let's start with the big letter P here. P. P, 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 R, R, I, 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 intrinsic factor that absorbs vitamin b12 if you do not produce this you would end up with b12 deficiency um you can end up with something called pernicious anemia all right intrinsic factor but it also makes hydrochloric acid hcl now into the lumen of the stomach now what i want you guys to remember is Number one, think about a private investigator, PI, parietal cells make intrinsic factor. Hydrochloric acid controls the pH, okay, controls the pH. This is one way to remember a PI, a private investigator, parietal cells make intrinsic factor. Parietal cells control the pH of stomach by making hydrochloric acid, pH, parietal cells, hydrochloric acid okay pi private investigator okay <clears throat> the next one of these cells is called a chief cell and then we'll have our gastric glands these are the ones found in the stomach then uh, that's found throughout parts of the stomach. Then our pyloric glands are also there, but I'm going to separate them. Let's talk about chief cells. Chief cells make pepsinogen. Now, chief cells make pepsinogen. Now, I want you guys to think about, now, let me, let's answer the age-old question. Coke or Pepsi? Well, everybody knows that Pepsi is chief among colas.
not real. I do prefer Coke because I'm not a deviant. I'm just kidding. It's okay if you like Pepsi or Coke. I don't care. It's not something. I mean, <clears throat> I'll get upset if I find out that you guys uh, believe that certain groups of people deserve to be treated badly for any reason other, you know, than their horrible human um that's what's gonna make me mad if you think somebody you know <laughs> anyway so chief sales make pepsi in a gin just remember that pepsi is chief among colas and that'll help you remember pepsi pepsi in a gin okay and these are gastric glands The rest of these are going to be your pyloric glands. And your pyloric glands, what they're going to do is we have G cells, D cells, and F cells. That's about G cells. G cells make gastrin. It's pretty easy. You remember that uh, G cells make gastrin. Okay, so G... Cells make gastrin. Not hard to remember that. G cells make gastrin. What does gastrin do? Gastrin is what makes you hungry. It actually stimulates your chief cells and parietal cells. So what we're going to do with that drawing is we're going to go over here and we're going to say gastrin. Gastrin is going to go over here. Ah. Did you see what I did there? I didn't leave myself enough room to go over the top. I always do that. If I'm not doing this on a board, I mess it up. <laughs> I'm going to sneak around. There we go. So he's going to turn these two guys on. He's going to stimulate those two guys. Okay. I always did it that way when I draw it on the board. But... <laughs> okay. Now... Uh, that would be your now chief cells. Pepsinogen is actually turned into pepsin when it reacts with acids. Okay, when it reacts with hydrochloric acid. Let's talk about that a little bit. So pepsinogen, underline gin. Why? When hydrochloric acid comes in, HCl, Basically, what you do, let's imagine, if you will, that we have pep, sun, then here's the O, gin. And HCl comes in and takes the pepsin, activates it. And the OGEN precursor is just cut off. It's gone. And now it's active. And this is a protease. What's a protease? It breaks down proteins. You should know that from AMP1. That a protease breaks down proteins. Okay? It's a protease. Now, D cells produce somatostatin, which uh, is a uh, material that makes you not as hungry. It inhibits your, uh, well, it helps uh, inhibit gastrin production, it inhibits your G cells. So let's do D uh, over here. Now, Now think about a Nintendo DS. Uh, <clears throat> and then lastly, I forgot, uh, I almost forgot to get our P-cell. And it makes ghrelin. And it's rated PG. Okay, PG. Rated PG. Okay. PCGDP. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I've started sneezing. I went outside before coming in to do this, uh, checking our garden. 
and all the rain and everything. So I guess I got some, it's a little chilly and I got a little bit, uh, some drainage from that. Okay. So now, do you know what those things do? What each of these secrete? Always like to ask that. Now, uh, chemical digestion. So you're going to break down carbohydrates by your salivary amylase and lipids from lingual lipase. Um, and it's going to continue on here. Now, the stomach is a pH around 2. And proteins also get broken down by pepsin. And we're going to do a little bit more breakdown there as well. Now, we don't absorb nutrients by the stomach, except for things like aspirin can get absorbed really quickly because of its solubility and things like that. So aspirin is a very fast-acting uh, medication because it can actually enter the digestive tract in the stomach. Now, the stomach is regulated by three distinctive phases, kind of like how swallowing was. There's the cephalic phase. Now, the cephalic phase is one of the most interesting because this has a lot to do with what's going on in the brain. Give me one second because I'm going to fix a few little issues here. Sorry, uh, if my spacing, it just bugs me. And if I don't do it now, I will never remember to do it. The cephalic phase, guys, it does begin in the brain. So what's happening is if I smell food, I see food, I think about food, I get a little taste of food, then I'm going to start having my vagus nerve, parasympathetic vagus, stimulates my, activates my mucus cells, my chi cells, my parietal cells, my G cells. And all the postganglionic fibers that are controlling this, now it only lasts for a few minutes. Now this is a very important, the cephalic phase is the one, that's the phase that advertisers and stores love to try to take advantage of. Okay. Now I know you guys have been driving down the road before and you smell that smell coming from Burger King. They put that fake grill smell out. Now, I'm going to tell you, when you smell grill, it's just something about that. It just makes me hungry. And I can remember when I finished graduate school, me and some friends, we we backpacked their own highlands for about three days, three days, two nights. Um, we hike in, we spent our first night in the barn shelter, and then we spent our last night in the uh, uh, high knob shelter. And, uh, you know, Yellow Mountain Gap and everything like that. So when we stay in the barn shelter and we get there that night, we hike and we get there that night. And our friend, uh, some of the uh, hiking friends of mine, some older people, a uh, couple, married couple who uh, 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 actually was the ones that dropped us off. They came back and they uh, they were waiting at the barn shelter with a grill. They come in and made us burgers. And when we smelt those burgers, there was nothing like that. Oh, and those, that, first, that ice cold Coca-Cola and a good burger after coming back from uh, being on the trail all day. That was just amazing. So I was starving. So but you drive by and you smell that grill smell kind of hit. And they, they want you to be like, man, you smell that. You're going to pull in and get a Whopper. That's what they're wanting you to do. Or you're at a they, – they show pictures of food. And they try to make it look so tasty. Uh, like you see the McRib is back. You're like, I got to pull in and get me one of them. Or uh, you're in a store and they have the free samples out. And you get a taste of that. You're like, I'm going to buy it uh, if it's good. And that's kind of what they're doing. Now, the but it only lasts for a few minutes. So if you have the willpower, just know the cephalic phase only lasts for a, a little bit. Yeah, it's all in your brain. It's all in your head. It'll be over after a few minutes. If you have that willpower, you could survive it. Now, the gastric phase is the food actually gets to the stomach. And when the stomach distends, that's one of the things that's going to happen. Stomach distends. When food gets to the stomach, the pH starts to go up. You start to reduce the acidity, get it more. It, food uh, makes it more basic because you're using the acids up. You start to get proteins and peptides. But it only lasts about three to four hours because the acids are processing and the digestive enzymes are processing the food. Now, the intestinal phase is when chyme starts to enter the small intestines, and this can last for hours as we start to really contract the pylorus, put some of that food through pyloric sphincter and du duodenum, allowing us time for that chyme to activate hormonal and neural actions of small intestines. So we want to give it time. We'll squeeze out some, let's it sample it, is it good? Is it not good enough? Does the stomach need to work harder on that? Okay. 
So what happens is the phallic food starts with I see food, I smell food, I think about food. My vagus nerve comes down. It stimulates my mucus cells, my chief cells, my parietal cells, my G cells to produce mucus, to produce uh, pepsinogen, to produce hydrochloric acid. Stomach starts to get a little bit like a little wobbly, uh, things like that. Gastrin is going to make you hungry, okay? And gastrin stimulates hunger is one of the things it does. You're going to want to be able to get food in you, but it doesn't last much. And actually, emotional states can exaggerate that. Uh, if you're angry, you can end up with uh, wanting to eat more or less. Sometimes people actually have the opposite effect. Now, the gastric phase, food gets in, you distend it, the stretch receptors are going to detect that. Uh, the pH gets elevated, it becomes more basic. Uh, that's going to stimulate some actions here, the stomach. Then we start to squeeze blood into the chyme, which is going to make the duodenum release hormones and other chemicals that actually will, and neural mechanisms to affect the stomach. We're going to get into that more eventually. Then I'll talk about how we poop. We'll talk about our reflexes. Now, the stomach does control the small intestines. That's why I was talking about here. When you eat and the stomach stretches, you have to poop after. Why is that? Well, you have two reflexes that regulate the small intestines from the stomach when the stomach fills with food. One's called a gastroenteric reflex. One's called a gastroileal reflex. When the stomach stretches and becomes full of food, it stimulates movement along small intestines, which then also stimulates movement of food through the ileocecal valve into the colon, which will then make the colon fill up, which will make you defecate. This is why you have to poop after you eat. It ensures that food goes from small intestine to large intestine. So usually after you eat, you have to poop. It's because of these two reflexes. Now, the intestinal phase has some really neural and hormonal responses. There's going to be some local responses as well, but the neural and hormonal are the big ones. Now, neurally, what hap happens is, is uh, our neural responses, baroreceptors, are stimulated when the stretch, uh, like it's stimulated, like uh, when food enters the intestines, it could adjust the stomach wall. And also chemoceptors, when food arrives, uh, this should be intestinal phase. Um, here I've got it correct here. Um, <clears throat> I need to change the title here. Actually, is uh, uh, what's this is what's going on in the stomach? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, these are newer notes, so there's a few little typos there. I haven't gone through as much of the fixing. Okay. So uh, when neurologically, when you stretch the wall or chemicals affect the, in the mucosa affect the pH, that will cause contractions and mixing due to these, okay? And also hormonal responses. Now there's a lot of things out there where hormones adjust it. And then there's some enzymes that help us adjust that. And I, this is where I had some typos that I need to fix. Hormones will stimulate uh, intestinal hormones to also affect and adjust. And intestinal hormones uh, will actually come back and affect the stomach as well. There's pepsin, who's a protease, who's made from your chief cells, from pepsinogen. Salivary amylase will help break down the carbs. Intrinsic factor will help you absorb your vitamins like vitamin B12. Lingolipase will break down your lipids. And gastrin will be released from G cells to stimulate the G cells and parietal cells. And then also parts of the stomach will then be released from histamines and affect mast cells to actually cause parts of the, the parietal cells to release stomach acids. So you can actually have histamines can actually stimulate contractions of the gut and also secretion now in the intestines it will send neural stimuli back to the stomach to decrease gastric activity to help kind of make the stomach slow down and do a better job it basically gives your small intestines more time to deal with 
what's going on with what the stomach's giving it. Let's say the stomach is working too fast. Case in point, if the duodenum starts to stretch, it needs to slow the stomach down. Because, it, it, hey, you're giving me too much too, too fast. If the duodenum detects that the pH is too acidic, it needs to allow the stomach to slow down so it can deal with it. And then hormonally, if there's proteins detected uh, in the chyme that duodenum gets, the stomach is not doing a good job. And uh, so let me... Uh, do some things there. Uh, here we go. I, uh, it's been kind of bugging me that these are, let me pause so you don't have to see me. Sorry, these are my newest notes and they're just not. So hormonally, if the, if there's chyme in the duodenum and it has proteins, that means the stomach is not digesting enough. So we will send hormones that the G cells uh, in the duodenum will make gastrin. And that gastrin will do just like gastrin did uh, from the stomach, but it, also is made by the small intestines will go back and turn the chief cells and parietal cells on more to try to increase the activity of the stomach to make it work harder and uh, let me fix something i see here sorry about that i if i don't fix it now and i'm gonna have to stop here soon I, i'll finish this up but i am hungry i'm hitting stomach uh hitting uh, my blood sugar is dropping, and I can kind of feel it. I feel a little out of sorts, so I'm going to go eat as soon as I finish this. Um, so what we're going to see is, guys, you're going to produce more gastrin, help increase digestion. And if chyme contains a lot of lipids and carbs, we make a hormone called CCK and gastric inhibitory peptide. And that will slow the stomach down to allow it to break those compounds down. CCK is released. It uh, uh, it also caused the release of other enzymes uh, out there. Now, there's another hormone called GIP, and GIP helps to cause the release of insulin. Now, if there's a drop below 4.5, if it gets below 4.5 in the intestines, intestines don't want to be too. They want to be a little bit more, toward, I mean, slightly acidic, closer to neutral, they release a hormone called saccharin to turn the parietal cells off and the G cells off, and that slows the stomach's actions down. There we go. And uh, then we make buffers to protect the duodenum, okay, uh, as well. So I need to do this. It's sorry about some of these new slides are just not the way I want them, and, and I'm picky. Now, the pancreas is endocrine and exocrine. We already talked about the islets or the endocrine cells. Pancreatic acini, those are the exocrine cells that produce digestive enzymes. There is the head of the pancreas, the body of the pancreas, and the tail of the pancreas. Uh, the head is actually uh, broad and found in the loop of the duodenum. The body is the slender part in the middle. And that goes towards the spleen, and the tail is what's it, this rounded part that's going to be attached to the spleen. The pancreatic duct, or duct of Wurzung, is the main duct down the middle. Then there's an accessory duct called the ductus santorini that gives another route for these enzymes to make it in. Now, um, I'm going to draw the bile duct in a little bit, but this blockage of this green bile duct is one of the common causes of pancreatitis. The most common cause is where a gallstone blocks this, which causes the main pancreatic duct to not secrete, and only if the accessory is there, which means digestive enzymes from the pancreatic acini accumulate and start to basically digest the pancreas a little bit, damaging it, causing pancreatitis. And that's the number one cause of pancreatitis. So this is why you learn this stuff, okay? Now, the Exocrine secretions make amylase. So here we have an islet of Langerhans with the alpha cells, the beta cells, the delta cells, and the F cells, as we learned about that in chapter 
uh, 18. Here I have Asini cells, and they secrete into the duct that makes the pancreatic duct. They secrete pac pancreatic amylase, which breaks down starches, just like salivary amylase does. Pancreatic lipases, which break down lipids, just like the lingual lipases do. Pancreatic nucleases, which break down nucleic acids. And pancreatic proteases, that break down proteins. Okay, They all tell you what they do. Amylase is the only one that is weird because... Because it's amylose is a type of pectin, amylopectin, it's a type of carbohydrate, uh, starches, we call that amylose, uh, has amylopectin in it, it's a, anyway, uh, the liver, uh, let me, uh, see how much I have left to do here, I am, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to pause. Uh, there will be, you might see an extensive break, but I've got to go eat something. I'm not feeling well. So I'm going to have to stop. I'm starting to get really foggy. So, <laughs> all right, I'm back. Uh, so it wasn't long for you guys, but it was quite a bit longer for me. Um, so we're going to be picking up the liver now. And the liver has four lobes to it the right lobe which is largest, the left lobe, which is next, then at the back between the gallbladder here and uh, this little ligament, ligamentum uh, teres or the round ligament of liver, you will find the quadrate lobe and as well as behind here near the vena cava, you will find the caudate lobe. There is the falciform ligament, uh, which marcates the right and left lobe, called the falciform ligament. You will find the round ligament, which is the inferior end. This is what used to be the ductus venosus, actually, of the fetal circulation. Uh, the right and left hepatic ducts, uh, which we're going to talk about momentarily, uh, can be seen uh, here, just not very well on this diagram, but there will be two of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of turn to a drawing, and I'll go ahead and do the whole biliary system now uh, while I'm at it. Uh, but up here I'm going to write liver. And coming from the liver, there will be two bile, uh, two hepatic ducts. Uh, there is the right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct. And together, these unite to form a common hepatic duct. And then uh, what's going to actually happen is you have another duct attached to the gallbladder called the cystic duct Oops. cystic duct and then the, once that happens we have a common bile duct and the common bile duct uh, actually unites with the uh, right here with the uh, pancreatic duct anatomically here to our duodenum, duodenum or duodenum. So what happens is your two, your right and left hepatic ducts unite together to form a common hepatic duct. Then the gallbladder's cystic duct unites to the common hepatic and forms the common bile duct that goes to the duodenum and secretes bile there. Now, what I want to show you is, so we got the common hepatic, but we'll come into that in a minute. Now, the liver, liver has three major functions, metabolic regulation, hematological regulation, and production secretion of bile. Now, metabolic regulation means basically we are looking at the composition of blood by removing waste and toxins and excessive nutrients. Now, you don't want to have too many proteins or too many amino acids in the, in the bloodstream. You don't want to have too much glucose in the bloodstream. You don't want to have too much of 
anything in the bloodstream. We all everything has a range, and the liver has a job of keeping all of this stuff going on metabolic things in the blood. Now, not only that, but it regulates the blood cells. Remember that the liver, the liver, the spleen, and the bone marrow contained um, macrophages that help us to. Uh, destroy old worn out blood cells and these cells in the liver are called Kupfer cells and the Kupfer cells they remove the old red blood cells and even some pathogens from the blood and then with that guys will be the synthesis and production of bile bile is made from cholesterol cholesterol is a steroid remember and this is going to be produced by the liver as well so what we would see metabolically is we regulate things like the composition of blood by helping us remove toxins uh, and wastes and excessive nutrients. We can stabilize the glucose levels by either turning glucose to glycogen or breaking glycogen down into glucose. Uh, we can regulate our triglycerides and other fatty acids and even cholesterols. We basically can break down lipid reserves when we need it. And then also remove excessive amino acids. We do not want uh, other things in there. Now, I know I mentioned waste before, and here I'm just about waste toxins and drugs again. Drugs is more what I want to emphasize on that, and I probably could kind of do that. Now, also, it stores vitamins. Uh, the liver stores vitamins like the uh, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, and B12. Especially helps to store it. Uh, when your diet is poor so that it has it when you're eating a very poor diet, like when you're in college and living on ramen noodles, for example, as a graduate student. Now, we also store iron there. We know iron is a necessary component for producing um, uh, uh, hemoglobin, and we know that transferrin is going to grab that iron up, and we can store some iron in our liver as well. And then we detox drugs. We remove drugs and other toxic compounds from the blood. So it, it seems like a lot of that gets repetitive uh, to some degree, and kind of is, kind of not is. Uh, this is the way the book put it, so I like to kind of be a little bit more on that. Now, the Kupfer cells are the hematologically regulating cell. They remove the old red blood cells, but they also produce by far most plasma proteins. This is why a patient who has uh, a disease kind of like, let's say this person is cirrhosis of liver, they're an alcoholic, that alcoholics oftentimes have bleeding problems. And that's because most of the plasma proteins, and we know that many of the plasma proteins, and one of those is fibrinogen, is actually made by the liver. Now, hormones are broken down also by here. For example, epinephrine, norepinephrine, insulin, and even some other things like vitamin D3 is also broke down here. Not only is it broken down here and removed, but it is also aid in the production. It is part of the D3 production process to make vitamin D, colocalciferol, ultimately is involved in this to go on to be producing in the calcitriol. Then it also helps us remove antibodies and can turn those antibodies that we have into amino acids, use them for other things. And again, hematologically, we're also removing toxins from the blood, things that don't need to be there. So there's always this kind of repetition here. We're going to see this kind of... Now, secretion of bile is made from cholesterol. Now, cholesterol, uh, you may notice that a high-fiber diet lowers cholesterol. Why? Well, what happens is when fiber is in the food and the chyme enters the intestines with lots of insoluble fiber, uh, cellulose, it will actually bind the uh, bile to it. Bile will stick to it, and instead of being reabsorbed, it is stuck and will be defecated. Then the body has to produce more bile. So what does it do? It pulls cholesterol out of the blood to make more bile for the body, and thereby lowering cholesterol. So a high-fiber diet lowers cholesterol. Then bile, it does what we call emulsifying. Have you guys ever had, like, say, a vinaigrette dressing 
Uh, you know, they think about like the Italian dressing you get in the bottle, and it settles out. The oil and the water don't mix because one's polar, one's nonpolar. Uh, the vinegar uh, and some of that is a polar compound. The oil is nonpolar. It can't mix, but you shake it and then put it on your salad. If you were to put bile in it, it would create tiny droplets that coat each of these things with the bile salts, and it makes tiny little emulsive droplet. It makes little bubbles of the of the oils and lipids that can be bubbled up to allow them to be partially not dissolved but suspended. Okay? And this also apes helps in digestion because these bubbles, these little droplets, sorry about the dog barking, these droplets can then be exposed by enzymes. So when it's called emulsion, it allows the libases to break it down and to absorb by the small intestine those lipids. Now, gallbladder, we said, stores bile. The bile is produced by liver, and basically what's going to happen is anatomically, you're going to come from the liver, and you're going to want to go straight on in, but it hits a sphincter here, and if this sphincter is contracted, the bile will accumulate and fill the gallbladder up. And then only can come out when this sphincter, as I drew here, is the sphincter. I'm going to label it in a minute. Sorry about our dog. People are out walking now that it stopped raining and it's not windy as bad. People are walking in the neighborhood. And our newest dog goes nuts. Uh, she's crazy. So I apologize. Now, we said there, uh, we saw the cystic duct, the duct of the gallbladder. We saw the common bile duct. The hepatopancreatic sphincter is the sphincter that controls the release of bile into duodenum, and there's a hormone called CCK. Not CCR, not Cretan's, not Cretan's Clear Water Revival. We're talking about CCK. Cholecystokinin, uh, which we'll learn more about later. Now, the small intestine is where 90% of absorption happens. 90% of the absorption that occurs in the body occurs in your small intestines. And there's actually three anatomical regions. There is, now the duodenum is by far the shortest part, closest to the stomach. So in blue here is the duodenum. I've always thought about doing this number and like coming in and be like, okay, that that's close to the to that blue there. And then jejunum and that's close to that purple there, and and uh, <clears throat> ileum, and this is close to that pinky there. I've always thought about doing this, and uh, uh, you're like, <laughs> you are doing it. What are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> and let's see here. Oh, can I get a color that matches? Let's see. Let's get him in there and see. Ah, that looks... That looks like it, doesn't it? Okay, that's close enough. Government work. Okay, close enough for government work. The middle section is the jejunum and the jejunum, and the ileum is the longest section near the end. It attaches large intestines. To remember them, just think about a DJ, DJ Ileum. Man, he'd be spitting, dude. He'd be, whoop, 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 right? He'd be spitting. He'd be really. Uh, cutting those records. So the duodenum, DJ, ileum. Duodenum, jejunum, ileum. I need to work on a better color there. It's, you're like, uh, she's going to spit half the class just trying to find a color that, that he's satisfied with. Because he's weird. Kind of need like a rose color, you know? It's like rosy sandstone or something like that. Like maybe that. There we go. That's better. Okay, so that's closer anyway. Now, the ileocecal valve is the sphincter that regulates the flow from small intestine to large intestine. And uh, it's a sphincter. It's called the ileocecal valve, sometimes called Tulp's valve. Um, if you guys see the uh, my really silly picture in the background here, which is actually based on a Rembrandt painting, um, uh, the anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp. Uh, this guy uh, um, <clears throat> of Dr. Nicholas Tulp, uh, the famous Rembrandt painting, 
this is the guy who actually discovered the ileocecal valve and first described it. And I always see this, and it's like this guy here is kind of like, wait a minute, this isn't uh, this isn't calculus. <laughs> He's like, I'm in the wrong class. I'm in the absolutely wrong place. What about I end up here? It's kind of like when I thought I was in calculus, turned out to be in a business class. Instead, I went to the wrong room because uh, I was in a part of ETSU I didn't know. <laughs> so, all right. Now, the small intestines. These uh, have the plica circularis. These are circular folds that encircle the entirety of the, smooth, uh, of, the, of the small intestines. They increase the surface area for absorption. Along with that are the villi. The villi are the finger-like projections that also increase surface area for absorption. Then there will be lacteals. And a lacteal is a lymphatic capillary found within the villi to absorb and transport fatty acids. There's also going to be secretory areas called intestinal crypts or crypts of libricune, um, the intestinal glands or the crypts of the intestinal crypt. I always wanted to put an intestinal crypt keeper or go in here and put a... Uh, uh, blue band, somebody wearing a blue bandana hiding out in there because it'd be the Crips. <laughs> um, called the Crips of Libracoon. Now, the Crips of Libracoon, I've heard of the intestinal Crips and intestinal gland before when I was a student, but I never heard them called Libracoon. That was one of the words I never heard of before I came here. Aggregated lymphoid nodules that are located called Pears Pyres patches. They are lymphoid nodules. They aggregate in small intestines from any bacteria that may backflow from large intestine or colon into the small intestines, which could secrete chemicals that would interrupt digestion and damage the digestive enzymes, damage the digestive tract, things like that, cause widespread infection. The duodenum, like we said, it's the smallest, closest, shortest, and closest to the stomach. It's only about 25 centimeters long, which is about 10 inches. We call it the mixing bowl because it receives about it receives chyme from your stomach, but it also receives liver secretions through the bile duct and pancreatic secretions from the common, I mean, from the pancreatic duct and the accessory pancreatic duct. So it receives chyme from the stomach. And it helps to neutralize any acids that may have damaged the rest of the small intestines absorbs in surface. The jejunum is in the middle. It's about 2.5 meters, so it's 8.2 feet roughly. Um, this is where most chemical digestion occurs. When it does occur here, most of the chemical digestion uh, that happens in the intestines happens here. Though it mixes in the small intestine and the duodenum, it goes into the jejunum and completes the chemical digestion. And this is also where most of the nutrient absorption. Now, I don't want you guys to think that most chemical digestion of the digestive tract happens here. It is where most of the chemical digestion of the intestines happens in this part of the intestine. There aren't that many plaque circularies, and they get small, and the villi get smaller. Then as we enter the ileum, we will see that's the last thing. It's actually 3.5 meters or 11.48 feet long, so quite long. Uh, and at the end is the ileocecal valve or tulps valve located here that enters into the, small, uh, into the cecum. Now, intestinal movements, they are controlled by smooth muscle. They're visceral motor neurons in the submucosa that control things like pyloric sphincter, sphincter and the peristalsis to move chyme towards jejunum. And the parasympathetic nervous system is what accelerates that. Sympathetic would, of course, slow it down. Now, here's kind of the last big part. And I'm going to say these six hormones you need to pay attention to. There will be some clinical based questions on these, like if somebody didn't produce this, what might go wrong or something like that um, when it comes to this exam. Now, um, if you guys are watching this for the summer semester, uh, you will see three of these on multiple choice questions. 
you definitely need to know things like what uh, what they do, what turns them on, what turns them off, that kind of what's their functions, that kind of stuff. You know, what turns them on, what's their function, what sales might produce, some things like this. They are called enteroendocrine cells, found in the duodenum. There are peptide hormones that have many effects, a variety of different parts of the digestive tract, all produced in some kind of accessory organs and glands found within the uh, in the digestive wall, and also some other places. And we're going to see gastrin, which we know is made by the stomach, but is also made by the duodenum. Secretin, which we also have heard of. Cholecystokinin, gastric inhibitory peptide. There are only two we haven't heard of yet, and that's vasoactive intestinal peptide and enterocrinin. Okay, so let's talk about these. So each one is made by the duodenum, and I will hit these. They are hormones. They go into the bloodstream, and they go to the stomach and to other organs to impact them. Now, let's start with the chemical gastrin first. Gastrin is the first one on our list, so let's start with gastrin. Now, gastrin is also made by the stomach, but there are G cells in the duodenum. And when there are large amounts of incompletely or partially digested protein, the body is going to release gastrin to go to the stomach to increase its motility, which is going to make the stomach move more, but it's also going to make hydrochloric acid. It's also going to make pepsin, pepsinogen production, to help to break these proteins down, okay? It's going to enhance digestive process, okay? Gastrin. Secretin is when there is acid chyme in the duodenum. Sorry if you can hear the dog barking again. Secretin, when acid chyme arrives, not just chyme, but acidic, when the chyme is now acidic, secretin is secreting to make buffers. It also increases as, uh, production of bile. It increased bile production and buffers by the pancreas. Now, the bile will help get rid of fatty acids. And also, it will like, release the buffers from pancreas, the buffer here being bicarbonate, to actually increase the pH of the chyme to get it closer to 7, uh, around that 4.2, 4.5 mark. And then also it reduces gastric motility and secretion. So basically secretin kind of turns off gastrin, kind of becomes a gastrin inhibitor, okay? Cholecystokinin. When there are lots of lipids and partially digested proteins that end up in the duodenum and all this fat droplet, you will take the fats and that will cause the duodenum to release CCK. And CCK will actually contract the gallbladder, makes it contract, squeezing out the bile and relaxes the, uh, um, the hepatopancreatic sphincter. And uh, so it actually also accelerates pancreatic enzyme production, stimulates the pancreas. It relaxes the pancreatic sphincter and contracts the gallbladder. Back in the day when people had gallstones, what they would do is for like a week or two, like two weeks, you can't eat any fat. And they would say, can't eat fats for two weeks. And they wouldn't let you eat fat. Then they would come in and they would give you a, 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 a thing, a substance called castor oil, and castor oil, you would drink it, and all that lipid would hit, the oil would hit the duodenum, and it would cause so much CCK production that your gallbladder would contract so hard, it would just shoot, pew, the little, the little guy out, the little uh, gallstone out. <clears throat> so it ejects that uh, pancreatic juice in the duodenum. Okay, ejects bile and pancreatic juice. That's basically its two major functions. Uh, now, gastric inhibitory peptide is when you have fats and carbs in the small intestines, and it does inhibit stomach activity, which I do need to put that in there. Um, I need to add that. 
uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide. It actually stimulates secretions of intestinal glands to prepare for food arriving, but it also dilates the capillaries, and it actually inhibits the action of the stomach. The stomach now has done its job. It's getting ready to, it's actually going to tell the intestines it's time to absorb. Enterocrinin's job is to come in and uh, um, cause, uh, just anytime any chyme enters, it simulates mucus production in the duodenum and rest of the digestive tract just to prepare the small intestine for, for chyme arrival. Uh, it's just anytime chyme is released. So enterocrinin is always going to be released during any time you have uh, intestinal phase of digestion. But remember, vasoactive intestinal peptide, yes. Um, but uh, you may not produce CCK every single time if you if you, if you had uh, done some other digestion or sacritin or, or things like that. And these hormones will be emphasized definitely on an exam. Uh, now let's talk about large intestine. Large intestine has the cecum, the colon, and the rectum. Now I like to think about the colon, the large intestine, as a gated community. It's a fancy neighborhood, a gated community. Let's imagine we live in colon meadows. Now in colon meadows, you turn off the ileum and you come into a gated community. Here's the gate, the ileocecal valve. And we hit the cul-de-sac, the cecum. And there's a guard on duty, the appendix. And everybody has a haustra on Tinny E. coli lane. Tiny E. coli lane. It's the muscle that runs the length. And it forms these bulges called haustra. It kind of looks like a subdivision. And we'll go up ascending colon. Then we'll turn on right colic flexure. Onto transverse colon. Then we'll turn on left colic flexure. Go down to descending colon. Then we'll go on to sigmoid flexure. Down into sigmoid colon. Then we're in the crappy part of the neighborhood. The rectum. Wrecked him. Darn near killed him. <laughs> okay. So the cecum is the first part of the large intestine containing the vermiform appendix. The colon has your tiny E. coli muscle that contracts to produce the haustra. The haustra are folds that allow it to expand. There are four sections, ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid. The three colic flexures are the right, the left, and the sigmoid. And the rectum is the last six inches of the colon. It stores your feces. There your anus is with your two anal sphincters. An external anal sphincter and an internal anal sphincter control the anus. Now the large intestines, for example... It begins with the ileocecal valve and goes to the anus, but with that, it reabsorbs a lot of water. Now, what if it reabsorbs too much water from the chyme? You actually have constipation. If it doesn't reabsorb enough water because the food moved through it too fast, you would have diarrhea. So this is where diarrhea and constipation comes from, is the lack of your messing up reabsorption. It's either happening too slow and it reabsorbs too much, or you get something that actually goes too fast and it reabsorbs too little. And that causes both constipation and diarrhea, respectively. We also absorb or produce nutrients. Now, our body produces these vitamins, vitamin K, biotin, and B5. B5, now vitamin K is needed for blood clotting. You will bleed. Now, a baby usually doesn't have that ability to produce it because they haven't been eating, their uh, bacteria haven't colonized it properly, and a baby won't have that ability, so we give them a vitamin K shot so they don't bleed to death when they leave the hospital. Biotin is used in glucose metabolism. Biotin is is uh, used to produce, if you guys have had microbiology, then you probably heard of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide and flavin adenine dinucleotide. Uh, if you haven't, then my gosh, I feel sorry for you. Um, you would have definitely heard about it from me. Vitamin B5 is used to make neurotransmitters and steroids, but it also stores the feces. Okay. Um, now, let's talk about how you poop. And I think that's actually one of the last things that we talk about is how you poop. 
Pooping involves two positive reflex loops, a short and a long. Now, what happens is, as food moves through the colon, it enters into the anus. And the distension of the anus, its distension, you will have uh, visceral sensory neurons will be detecting the distension of that through what's called the intestinal plexus. And it triggers a defecation reflex through two positive feedback loops, like giving birth, poop, to defecate. You have to be able to do that till it's complete, so it needs positive feedback. They're both triggered by the same thing, stretching the rectum. Now, a short reflex triggers the uh, peristalsis contractions of the rectum moving food in. The long reflex stimulates the mass movements to force it out along with this is together. This will help us defecate. Now, the long reflex is controlled by parasympathetic innervation by, par by, by these pelvic nerves, and they relax the internal anal sphincter. The somatic reflex, which is another part of this, actually is using pudendal nerves. Pudendal nerves, remember, are part of your sacral plexus. This contracts your uh, uh, external anal sphincter, causes it to stimulate the contraction there to open it up. And so you relax the internal anal sphincter, and next they have both have to open up, uh, stimulates the opening of these, and it opens. Um, uh, but to open the external is conscious. Okay. Uh, now anabolism, you build up, you use the raw materials to make things like. I mean, didn't we already talk about this at the first now? Uh, I'm pretty sure that I've done that now at the beginning. Uh, we used to do that at the end. I thought we did this at the beginning, and I couldn't remember. Yeah, we did. Uh, so let's just kind of recap it a little bit is anabolism is using the materials in the digestive tract to build things up like hormones or muscle tissues. Catabolism breaks things down to provide energy for the body. We also need oxygen. We need organic compounds, all kinds of good stuff. Now, I do want to mention that your carbohydrates are broken down by, you do need to know what enzymes break what down. Carbs are broken down by salivary amylase and pancreatic amylase. Lipids are broken down by lingual lipases and pancreatic lipases. Proteins by proteases by both pancreas and stomach, uh, which is usually pepsin. Um, now, um, some things like that. Now, I'm not going to ask you how we transport it. Most everything is by facilitated diffusion. Some things through simple diffusion. You may be active transport as well. Carbs especially. Guys, this concludes that, and uh, there we go. Thank you guys so much.